See this flock of starlings? It appears as though the flock as a whole, composed of many presumably simple-minded birds, exhibits intelligent behavior. Contrast this with the destructive power of a herd of elephants who are set off by a lion. We are astonished by what appears to us as collective madness. They trample everything in their path and they seem unable to stop. Individually, elephants are some of the most intelligent animals that we know, yet sometimes when set off, collectively they can exhibit madness. These two examples show that in the animal world we can observe both collective intelligence and collective madness. This is of course also true in human societies. <clears throat> the two basic institutions of modern societies are democracies and markets. Both of them have their flaws, of course, but <clears throat> at their best, they collect and synthesize the, collect the contextual knowledge, the beliefs and the values of millions of people. In contrast, some human institutions can make the participants collectively mad at times. Stock markets bubbles are a good example. Like in the poker game, many are bluffing about the quality of their assets. Many know the value of some asset is lower than, than what it is trading for. But because the price is going up, they keep buying, which doesn't reflect their knowledge about the true value of the asset. This leads to skyrocketing prices followed by crashes. Stock markets and electoral systems are human design systems. For most of our history, we've stumbled blindly in designing such systems. Sometimes, by chance, they give us collective intelligence, and at other times, they give us collective madness. In this talk, I want to invite you to imagine how we can deliberately engineer systems that are collectively intelligent. But first, I want to unpack some of the reasons for which so many of our systems lead us to collective madness. Once we understand that, <clears throat> Once we understand that, I hope you will see the contours of a better system. One major problem is that underlying many collective communication systems is a business model that gives us incentives to behave unintelligently. Let us focus on the example of social media. This platform's business model is to hack our attention and sell it to anyone who funds campaigns. There is no collective purpose to the communication that unfolds. To fulfill their business model, social media companies have optimized algorithms which alter the way we think and communicate. To grab our attention, the algorithms use a few tricks. First, they pigeonhole us into a few discrete categories of people to target. This loses the individuality and nuance of our tastes and opinions. Second, they pander to us by reinforcing what we already feel and believe. Indeed, an MIT study has shown that false information on Twitter spreads six times faster than true information because people have a greater emotional reaction towards fake news. The result of all of this is that our ideas become simpler, narrower, and more extreme. The algorithms also manipulate our behavior to serve the purposes of those who pay for our attention, whoever that might be. Extremist groups, too, can use these services to spread propaganda. Here's an arresting fact. 64% of the people in extremist groups on Facebook joined these groups because algorithms led them there. The business model of selling our attention and the algorithms that serve it lead to collective madness. As a collective, we have become more polarized and violent. Tragically, these platforms take us away from putting our minds together to solve real problems. A second major problem is that many systems lack transparency. Why is this a problem? To continue with the social media platform example, we cannot inspect the algorithms to see what they optimize for. They trap us in a game that we don't understand. We thus cannot critique it or even become aware of when and how the system is manipulating us. 
There is no mechanism for the system to improve and tend toward better outcomes. Lack of transparency and a business model based on manipulating our beliefs to grab our attention lead us to the third major issue. Participants in modern communication systems lack agency. We have no control over the algorithms that are just described, not even a vote. This means that we are not truly interacting. We are just being acted upon. And we have no power to creatively contribute to the system in a way that will make it work better. A collective intelligence system should empower users and give them the agency to improve the system to ultimately fulfill a collective purpose. The key role of agency distinguishes collective intelligence from artificial intelligence. The next time you lose a game of chess to an AI, ask it why it plays chess in the first place. It obviously has no purpose and so it cannot evolve its purpose. A group endowed with collective intelligence, in contrast, knows its own purpose, and every member can actively participate to shape and pursue it. To re recapitulate up to this point, I have pointed out three major flaws with dysfunctional collective communication systems. First, their business models are based on manipulating our minds to give our attention to those who pay. Second, they lack transparency, Third, they do not empower users to improve the system. Now, let's examine two inspiring examples of recent innovations in collective intelligence. The first example I would like to share with you comes from the book Digital Humanitarians by Patrick Meyer. This is a deeply inspiring book that tells the story of thousands of people collaborating with innovative online tools to help save lives during natural disasters and prepare communities to better face future ones. One story told in this book is that of crisis maps. Crisis maps are a human technological system that emerged in the aftermath of the January 12, 2010 earthquake that rattled port au -Prince in Haiti. It is a map, such as Google Maps or OpenStreetMap, but one that pinpoints areas where people might be trapped under rubble in real time or near real time. It combines the intelligence of volunteers with local on-the-ground information from social media, keeping people calling each other, consulting old maps and whatever information they can access online or offline. In producing this map, volunteers receive feedback from professional rescue missions as well as victims in near real time as to what features should be prioritized to save the most lives. Everyone and the whole system collectively had the same purpose, to save as many human lives as possible. In this example, people are working together to aggregate lots of information, but they also deliberate, deliberate with each other to find out how this information fits together. The second example is Folded. Folded is an online game that leverages the collective intelligence of the gaming community to solve protein folding puzzles. Understanding the structure of proteins is a key step in the treatment of diseases. A protein can fold in a number of ways, as seen in the image on your screen, making this a challenging puzzle even for computers to solve. In fact, the structure uh, for an AIDS-like virus found in monkeys was so challenging to solve that re researchers had been puzzled for this uh, over this problem for 13 years. In 2011, the Folded community solved it in three weeks. Players knew nothing about protein folding, and they were asked to solve a fun puzzle. They were given a, vi a visual representation of the protein and had to fold it as small as possible using simple tools called wiggle, shake, and rubber bands. Each tool has a different role that affects the protein's shape. Every shape is given a ranking, but only the most compact structures earn the highest scores. High scoring structures have been successfully used to cure complex diseases. The power of the collective in this example comes from the fact that many people experiment with different approaches to the same problem. This illustrates an important point 
about collective intelligence. Groups of laymen with diverse perspectives and ways of approaching the problem often outperform a small group of experts. If all members sufficiently engage, the collective as a whole often outperforms the most intelligent person in the room. Both folded and crisis maps are collective online games, just as fun and socially interactive as social media. Yet, their purpose is transparent, to solve an important human problem. And they give users agency. The results are astonishing feats of collective intelligence. The examples I just told you about rely on aggregating information and insights of, uh, about the past or the present state of the world. For many problems, though, we need to map the future. When we drive a car, we don't just look in the rearview mirror. We, of course, look ahead, anticipating obstacles. The future isn't like the past, and especially not if you're trying to impact it. To navigate the future, we need beliefs about how the world works and what is possible to achieve. To navigate the future together, we also need a way of synthesizing all of our beliefs into a collective understanding. I would like to sketch the contours of what I call the collective intelligence game. This is a game that would allow each one of you to lay out your beliefs and insights and then pull all of this intelligence together to map out possible futures. At the heart of the system are two magical ingredients. The first one is a language that allows you to logically express your beliefs about how the world works and what we can do to improve it. For example, if one participant believes that smoking causes cancer, she will draw a causal error from the smoking concept to the cancer concept. If she is unsure about the link or thinks it only happens some of the time, she can also assign a probability to this causal error. This simple representation then means I believe with some specific probability that if this person smokes daily, she will get cancer. Of course, this is more general. We can design a graphical language in which objects and concepts are nodes in a graph and verbs express relationships between them. These relationships are represented as arrows connecting the nodes. In addition, the language is probabilistic because real-world relationships don't operate 100% of the time in the same way and we are not 100% sure about them. So verbs are relationships in a language and they are probabilistic. The magic here is uh, that we have a precise but intuitive language to encode and share our beliefs. The second magical ingredient of our system is the prediction market. The prediction market aggregates our individual beliefs into a collective belief. This is best illustrated by another example. Suppose that two people disagree about the probability of rain in London tomorrow. A thinks that the probability is 70% and B thinks this probability is only 30%. A will now sell the following contract to B. For a price of 50 pence, A sells to B the promise that she will pay B one pound in the case that it rains tomorrow in London. B would be a fool not to accept this contract. Can you see why? B is buying a contract that she thinks is worth, only, is, is worth 70 pence for the price of 50 pence. A is selling for 50 pence something that she thinks is worth only 30 pence. Given their beliefs, they both gain if they make this trade. The 50 pence price that emerges from this interaction represents an average between A and B's belief. This is the magic of prediction markets. They synthesize the beliefs of crowds and arrive at a more accurate estimate of the truth. In this way, the beliefs expressed by the participants with the graphical language I just described will be aggregated into a collective mental map just like the folded community, users create a complex map, but, but instead of mapping a protein, now we are mapping our uncertain future and its possibilities. Such a game is incredibly transparent. The participants' incentive is to honestly represent what they truly believe and never to manipulate. In addition, everyone can literally see what everyone else believes to be true. 
Participants also have lots of agency because they can credibly express their views in a very nuanced way. In contrast, when you vote, you can't explain to anyone why exactly you voted in this way. Such a system could be used by communities to solve complex problems. For example, our friends the digital humanitarians, whom we met earlier in the talk, could use it to plan ahead. It would allow participants to express and map all of the vulnerabilities in their communities, cities, towns, villages, to build resilience. Examples of designed collective intelligence are still far and few between. We've only started scratching the surface of what is possible. We are a burgeoning community of scholars, engineers, and developers. Down the road, I hope we'll create a collective communication system that will allow communities, communities to creatively identify their problems. It will empower them to solve them far more effectively and fairly than with our current tools. Our current tools for solving collective problems are still crude. Think of our armies of experts who are disconnected from people's daily experiences, our small town meetings which are not very fun and in which only opinionated people speak, our plethora of surveys which are imprecise and superficial. If building better system inspires you, I invite you to join the collective intelligence enthusiast community. I invite you to come and experiment with new systems and help us design and improve them. Thank you very much.